Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session of our Artists in the Age of COVID series, which is a co-production between the Edinburgh International Festival and uh, the Edinburgh International Culture Summit. So my name is Jenny Niven. Um, I'm a programmer and producer and I'm the executive producer at the Culture Summit. And we are just delighted to have had this incredibly enriching, invigorating week of discussions um, with visionaries and makers and creatives um, from all over the world who've been helping us to unpack some of the um, big questions swirling around the arts um, just now. So today um, our session is going to be signed um, by Nicole and Jill, that's Jill's um, signing first and um, they'll be with us throughout this, the session um, and Trisha is supporting us on captioning today. Um, so joining me on the journey uh, that we're going to take today are Jackie Wiley, she's Artistic Director and CEO of the National Theatre of Scotland, um, Rosera Seidel, who is Artistic Director of the National Festival of Arts in Singapore, no she's not, in South Africa, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have Helen Young, who's an inter- and transdisciplinary artist who combines design, performance, conceptual art and social R&D. Uh, she's based in Canada. I'm just sorry, Paul, it's going very fast for you to keep up with all of our participants. Um, and also Jake Elwes today, he's in London. Um, he's an artist who works, at, uh, works in machine learning and code. Um, and appropriately for today, is really interested in both the possibilities and the consequences of digital technology. Um, so today's session is about intersections and what we're keen to do, I think, is to look at, um, to reflect on the moment that we're in and look at how that is affecting the actual work that we're making. Um, and inevitably that takes the, t the conversation towards digital. Um, so we're looking at major organisations who are having to kind of rethink their work in, uh, for a digital presentation as opposed to a live one. Um, but then also to push into the aspect of the conversation because there's so many people that have already been working in digital all this time. Um, and so trying to look at where, where one kind of leads into the next um, and what Jake's take on that sort of turbocharging in a way um, of all these organisations suddenly working in this way and how that feels from the perspective of somebody who already works in digital art. And then the other aspect of intersections that I'd like to look at is how art then connects out into other bits of society. And we've had some really interesting conversations already this week about um, the values and the purpose and the why of what we do. Um, and I think that will lead us in, uh, hopefully, in an interesting way into um, some of the things that Helen is working on. Um, but just to get it, so welcome everybody and thank you so much um, for joining us. Uh, but to start us off, and I might ask you this question first, Jackie, can you just tell us what you have been working on since this pandemic began and tell us where we find you in terms of the um, NCS just at this moment? Yep. <clears throat> Hi everybody. Um, so the National Theatre of Scotland is, um, well it was the first national theatre to exist without a theatre building of its own, which we call Without Walls. So a Without Walls theatre means that we work wherever, we make theatre wherever there's an audience to be found and we work in collaboration with the Scottish theatre sector and we take our work all over the world. So. At the point of the lockdown and the start of the COVID crisis, we realised that because we were a without walls company, we had a particular responsibility to carry on making theatre work. So one of the ways that we did that was to launch a programme called Scenes for Survival, which essentially was about taking our work of um, creating theatre, but, but switching that onto a digital online offer. What that meant was putting together small teams of writers, directors and actors to create pieces of work that were filmed in what we were at that point calling their um, spaces of isolation, which really was their own homes. But uh, we wanted to acknowledge that some of those people, for example, Brian Cox, Alan Cummings, uh, were making their pieces from all across the world. So basically we put together small teams and um, we're 
we're now getting towards the end of it and we've made 50 digital artworks that have been seen by uh, over 12 million people all across the world, which is beyond our kind of wildest expectations at the start of the lockdown. And we did that work in collaboration with uh, BBC Scotland and BBC Arts, which has been an amazing um, new way of working for NTS, which I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about later on about the kind of uh, cross art form potential that we're all realising. We also launched a series of um, digital works called Playdates, which was about trying to support the parents who were homeschooling. We felt a real kind of public service responsibility to families who were at home, felt isolated, were suddenly dealing with their children at home. So we launched a series of interactive learning tools and kind of playful storytelling um devices to support families at home we also um worked on a project called macker to macker with jackie key the scottish uh poet laureate which is called a macker in scotland for those of you um who are joining us from across the world and that was really a series of um, to celebrate scottish poetry to celebrate um scottish folk music to tell stories uh every uh, Thursday night um, with lots of different guests. And then the final thing is um, a project called Ghost Light, which we've just uh, launched with the Edinburgh International Festival, which really is act the interesting thing. It's one of the most ambitious projects that the National Theatre Scotland has actually ever done, but yet we did it within the context of the lockdown. And it is a filmic love letter to the act of theatre making. Um, I'll, maybe let, I'll maybe let you see a little clip from it and then I can explain to you afterwards uh, what it is. So if we could have a little. All the lives I've lived, my beating heart, my cheating heart, my costumes, my masks, all the lives I've lived behind the heavy curtains, my costumes packed in boxes, Waiting, silenced. The future beats with the past's old heart. So that was the fabulous Siobhan Redmond doing um, an extract from the film that was written by Jackie Gay. The film was created inside the Festival Theatre in Edinburgh and um, took extracts from National Theatre of Scotland's past work, current work and new commissions. And we worked with a filmmaker to try and reveal the labour and the kind of um, the kind of blood, sweat and tears that goes into theatre making, because all of us have been really considering the value of theatre and why we make theatre. So the film um, shows the kind of backstages of the theatre and evokes the atmosphere um, within within theatres as a way of celebrating all that we do while we're dark. It's so atmospheric. Um, I'm really struck by that 12 million people have seen scenes for survival. I had no idea. That's amazing. <laughs> we um, I mean, the thing about that, the 12 million figure is it, there's a lot, what is wonderful about it is that the two pieces that have been watched the most, one is Janie Godley's piece um, called Alone. And of course, for those of you watching from Scotland, you'll know who Janie Godley is and she's a kind of a uh, national treasure. She's a, a comedian, but her piece was about um, how challenging it is for some women to be alone with their families during the lockdown and really specifically about the COVID crisis. And Janie is a, is a kind of known, known figure, but she's really talking about something specific to COVID. And the other piece was written, the other piece which has had the most views was written by a, a, a writer who is also a nurse on the COVID wards. And she wrote about the domestic staff who support the work of the nurses within the hospitals during the crisis 
and it was um, a piece performed by an actor who we found through an open call that had never never um, worked with National Theatre Scotland before. But there was just something about the celebration of the key workers and the fact that the project was able to take audiences through the live, you know, the experience that we're all going through right in this moment that felt really particular and, you know, it's really touched people's hearts in, in, a, in a real way because we're able to articulate what is happening in real time. Yeah, it's really interesting this this week in our conversations how often um, we've come back to that, what it is that art is doing to reveal the moment as we're in it. Um, that's come up a lot. And also the kind of difficulty around in some ways the opportunity that these last few months have presented and how uncomfortable people feel in classifying anything around this as an opportunity but in fact creative people will find the opportunity and, and challenge um but we'll maybe come back to that and i don't want to leave anybody sitting quiet for too long um so rosera if i can bring you into the conversation can you tell us what you've been working on because you just delivered your festival just in the last month can you tell us a bit about that sure um just deliver the festival it's also um my first festival so i just uh just started working with the national arts festival in january and uh, it's our it's our 46th festival uh, this year and the first one that we took online so as you as you said uh we're the national arts festival is based in south africa and it's um uh so i mean our first COVID case was uh evidence on the 18th of March and so a little bit uh, a little bit later we had the the opportunity to see how this was kind of unfolding elsewhere in the world um I had just moved to Makanda actually and Makanda is the town where the festival is based um in January and uh by about mid-March we were facing the prospect of um of of lockdown and and very restrictive uh, regulations of course around eventing but around most other things, everyone was largely um, in their homes. So we made the decision very uh, quickly to, to take the festival online and not totally having uh, articulated to ourselves what exactly that means, but, that, but, but feeling that in the extremely short time that we had, between March and uh, end of June, beginning of July, which is when we would normally have the live festival, we uh, felt that, okay, we can we can do something in this time. And and so we announced it and, and we said, we're going online. So the last few months have been a total whirlwind and we did, we did just um, mount the festival and we're all still uh, recovering. Um, we, we, at the time when we made the decision, actually we had, we had already our 2020 festival largely in place uh, as a live festival so making that decision was very much a kind of total reconceptualization and, and to some extent starting over again and yeah it was extremely challenging i think across across all fronts but at the at that point in time in south africa i think you know our, our artists south african artists as artists around the world were facing the situation of having their 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 gigs and their tours uh, being cancelled or indefinitely postponed and so i think at the point when we made the decision and we began to 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 do this um it was uh, received really well by by artists um and the arts community a lot of questions um particularly i think from from the performance sector and from theater uh some some kind of fight back and like you know it's kind of a sense of being an abomination to take the, to take theatre onto screen, um, but we but we but we did it. Uh, I think what what's really interesting to share is that we so the National Arts Festival works. It's a multidisciplinary festival and it works on on, on an application uh, basis. So artists apply to uh, to to have their work. Part, uh, be part of the festival and there's different parts of the festival a bit like Edinburgh so there's a fringe there's a curated main jazz festival um, and what we have a, a part of the festival called the creative eight festival so in its third year this year really actually focusing on new technology new media digital but it's always been a, um, a small component of the of, of the festival and this year it really had the opportunity to come come into its own but what we did is instead of doing um, an application 
form where where artists have to have to kind of have everything worked out and apply with a particular work we we asked artists to apply with an idea and that was a very um conscious decision because uh, at least internally with the team we 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 weren't totally sure how we were going to do this and, and in the short space of time and and really i think that was quite instrumental in in having in opening up the space for a kind of dialogue um, and and opening up this the idea of the festival as a place for experimentation uh, it really i think allowed uh, artists to to take the risk with us in a way and and uh, some of their ideas and propositions that came back also then pushed us into figuring out how 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 do we do this how do we make certain things happen and we we ended up uh working in in, in many different ways uh which helped it to, to to support artists to 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 create work so we set up we set up um uh how many was it two four six venues across four towns um in partnership with local theaters so also um giving work and 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 uh two theaters which would otherwise have been closed down um uh, brought in uh, lighting crews and filming crews and created a space uh in a theater space where artists could could uh, where theater practitioners or performance uh, practitioners particularly could come in and 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 play and and kind of explore where where uh, the stage meets meets uh film and the screen um we also partnered with some institutions we facilitated various collaborations so we we, we tried lots of things and in the end we ended up with actually a really big festival um we had over 200 works um and uh and 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 quite a good attendance uh, a lot of interest and subsequently a lot of a lot of uh, artists who have made these works have had the um possibility to take the works works elsewhere and uh yeah generally still still recovering i kind of got blown away in in the midst of, of what we had what we set about doing but um quite quite an experience yeah so i'm feeling a bit tired now to be honest jenny <laughs> do you want to show us a quick clip of something is that a particular clip you'd like to refer us to sure i think yeah i think that the the lonely sailor weather report is what is um really a beautiful piece and it was um it's a work that emerged out of one of these uh institutional partnerships that we set up so it's a work that comes out of a collaboration between the Pop Out Theatre, which is an independent theatre, and the Fakugesi Digital um, Festival, which is which is a digital arts festival. Both are based in Johannesburg, and it was a kind of they set up a, a, a program, which uh, was, I suppose a kind of boot camp within with one or within one or two weeks, they uh, brought together digital artists and and theatre practitioners, sonographers, writers, directors, um, and 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 they. Kind of conceptualized and created short pieces so this work is is the lonely sailor weather report maybe we'll just show a, the, the initial clip it's it's several videos that that loop so this is the first the first one uh just let paul put that up <laughs> Here on Metzing FM, or oh, be ready for things here on 98.5 Metzing FM. Coming up soon is your excitement thing at 98.5 and putting the lights in the thing at who knows what's going to happen. So we'll see that later when you come back and we'll be excited all the things. And this is of course. Hey, 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 hey,
so that's the first piece it's called area one and i think there's seven short videos at present but that's a work that's that i think that collective is is going to continue to work on thank you i'm really fascinated um from nicole signing that for <laughs> for bsl audiences what would have tried Translated there and what, what that experience would have been like. It's amazing. Um, can I bring Jake? Can you come into the conversation, please? It's such a shame that people have to sit so quiet for so long. Um, but Jake, as somebody who's been working in digital for a long time already, um, can you tell me a little bit about how your practice and what you've been doing has been affected over the last few months? Um, and maybe begin to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of bigger picture observations on how everybody's. Um, Kind of practice has been has been changed. Yeah, of course. So first off, thanks so much for having me. Um, I guess I can't comment so much on the wider sector, but myself as an independent artist whose practice is mostly focused on the digital, I can talk about how my work has changed and developed and evolved in light of Corona. Um, I guess firstly, yeah, my my practice is primarily interested in artificial intelligence and bringing AI into new contexts and, and restaging it. So a work I made last year was all about um, bringing these artificially generated marsh birds and taking them out into the Essex marshes and seeing this conversation happening between nature and between the sort of most high tech cutting edge technology we have. Um, what, what I was producing last summer for the internet for the um, edinburgh festival with the edinburgh futures institute was a project called um zz querying the data set and that relates i suppose to corona I, I i've been thinking a lot about the queer community in corona um and this whole project zz is about thinking about the intersection between drag performance um, as a way of kind of expressing otherness and exploring gender um and connecting that with artificial intelligence which has a lot of issues in representation and bias built in by the people who are building these systems so maybe we show a second of, of the querying the data set i don't know if i can still speak over it whilst it shows it's a silent video um but these are three faces which have been created using machine learning and it's basically the all of these faces are fake they've been trained by injecting a thousand drag performers into a sort of standardized data set um, which mostly contains quite homogenous identities gathered by american engineers um i i guess there's something interesting maybe in in this time of corona thinking about these sort of layers of virtual platforms that we have so making a constructed identity um, from drag, which is already a constructed identity, and then putting that on a virtual stage. So just before Corona hits, the next iteration of this was supposed to be working on stage with a real life drag performer and looking at deep fake technology and the politics and ethics behind that and creating a cabaret show um, that would be on stage with a sort of musical theater duet. Um, so that piece was called ZZ and Me. Um, and this is an image, a sort of poster image. We've just released a, a sort of short teaser for it um, online. And you can see them performing anything you can do, I can do better. Um, so the next stage, really, which is most related to Corona, is a project which is part of a large project called The New Real, um, which is an art project curated by Drew Hemant. And it's going to be part of um, the Edinburgh International Festival. And that's in collaboration with the Edinburgh Futures Institute. And I guess that's kind of thinking about the vulnerability of the queer stage in Corona. And, and this was a piece that, you know, thoroughly developed and evolved out of the situation we are in right now. Um, so I had to rethink how was I going to create something where we can no longer have a physical stage, but actually it was really quite constructive because it got me thinking about how can we create a, a, a virtual stage? How can we explore some of these issues within artificial intelligence and create a digital art work that explores some of these ideas? Um, and, you know, I've been watching a lot of drag shows where they've been doing an amazing job of, of filming people socially distanced in theatres and broadcasting that 
or, or creating Zoom performances. Um, there's a wonderful one called um, The Queer House Party, which I suppose for vulnerable and marginalized groups, maybe queers at home in less supportive environments, you know, it's such an important thing to have these spaces. Um, so anyway, this, this piece is called ZZ, a virtual show. And the idea is that we're going to create a kind of virtual cabaret stage um, digital artwork where you can switch between all of these different identities. We've got drag kings, drag queens, kind of thinking about, you know, how, how you can have an exchange between these different deep fake bodies across gender, race and sexuality in groups that often aren't really thought about a lot by the people who are designing these systems. Um, so yeah, I think that that's what I'm working on at the moment. How has the um, collaborative aspect of what you do been affected by the last few months? Yeah, for sure. So that's obviously been really difficult because to make one of these systems, to create a deep fake, a kind of virtual drag performer, I need to film real drag performers for it to learn from. Um, so ZZ learns its movement and it learns its look from real performers. So actually, I'm working out at the moment kind of how it's possible to do socially distanced shoots and, and bring drag performers, um, you know, half a dozen drag performers, says performers from around the country together um, and, and create the footage that we need. And yeah, it's, it's difficult, <laughs> but it's something that we're all having to work out at the moment. And I think it will create a kind of different feeling and aesthetic and, you know, maybe get people to reflect a bit on on what we're losing and like I say the vulnerability of cabaret stages and queer venues. Thank you. Helen, one of the things that, um, yeah, you're a, a conceptual artist and working be in the space in between lots of different forms um, already. And maybe you can tell us a bit about that in just a second, but I was just thinking about what Jake was saying about um, community. Um, and thinking about some of the work that you've been doing um, with new immigrants to Canada and how that work has been really directly affected by this strange new way of working. Could you tell us about that or another aspect of your work that's been directly affected? Sure. Um, uh, actually, when the lockdown came, there were sort of several things happening simultaneously. Um, I was in the middle of a creation residency with um, uh, a group of newcomers. Um, they aren't artists. Uh, they come from um, engineering, finance, business, IT, uh, uh, and psychology backgrounds. Um, and at the same time, I was supposed to, uh, I was supposed to finish that residency with them at the end of March and then head straight to Germany to uh, design a show that was going to go uh, was going to premiere at the World Theatre Festival uh, in Dusseldorf and um, uh, and so then both things became virtual <laughs> and then um, uh, so with the work with the newcomers I don't know if it's possible to just show some of the video that uh, Stuart you have there uh, just to see their faces maybe at the beginning or I'll just keep going. Here we go. So this was uh, a residency done in collaboration with Luminato, um, which is a festival in Toronto. And um, we were in residence with the festival uh, that was in November, December, and then we had another creation residency that was over in uh, at the Meridian Arts Center, also in Toronto. Um, and sorry, I feel like this is going to be distracting, so maybe we'll pause it. There. Thank you. Um, uh, that was me not rehearsing that. <laughs> so um, we were in the middle of a creation residency, and uh, we pivoted right away um, to a virtual residency, which I really was not feeling confident about, but, uh, you know, the team said, oh, we can do it. Um, and uh, we came up with some strategies. Some Someone suggested that uh, we shouldn't meet for more than uh, 45 minutes time. Uh, it gets exhausting after that. Um, and 
uh, we did end up breaking that rule many times after that, but, um, but it was nice to start with some sort of awareness of each other's energies. Um, and for us also, because we uh, didn't want to support Zoom, uh, I spent a really long time assessing other video platforms, um, which is important. I mean, when you think about uh, holding space, uh, you know, what kind of space do you bring people in? So this was an example, thank you, um, of the video platform we used, which we were able to change the wallpaper in the background. So that's an image I chose. It's much more colorful and it's just instantly, um, as a sonographer myself, it's just really nice to be able to do an element of design in there. Um, and uh, so, the and the other thing I think that we noticed was that, I mean, I'm thinking about it now, what really helps is that um, we were doing this collective practice uh, very much um, in a way it was face to face because we were all there. We already had um, existing energies with each other. And so um, it's actually it was actually a very powerful form of uh, mirroring, which was only suggested at that time. And then when the residency ended, uh, I knew that there were a lot of uh, new immigrants and refugees who were having a lot of difficulties. They're here alone um, without supports. They thought they were, you know, they'd been hoping all along to find employment, find a place to live. Um, and then with the pandemic, you know, all of that goes out the window. It's ever more hopeless. Um, and I really want to make sure that we were able to offer something, but at the same time, having limited resources, um, what we came up with was to do one hour of creative practice every day. Um, we ended up doing it for six weeks. By the end of the six weeks, it was good weather and I just felt like people needed to be outside, not at their computer. Um, and um, we offered the creative practice. And so all these other people would show up in that same space you just saw. Uh, and, and the feedback was incredible. Um, people really, um, felt there was something different about that, like somehow the culture and the values and the ambiance really translated uh, and uh, people kept coming back. Um, it wasn't it wasn't enormous. It was always a, quite an intimate group, but um, but that was good. <laughs> it was, uh, lots of people said they wanted to come. Lots of people said, oh, I'm going to tell everybody I'm going to send my whole team. Uh, but my hypothesis is that it's a bit like going to the gym. Uh, you all know it's good for you. Just thinking about it makes you feel more healthy. Um, but the inertia of actually arriving is another thing. Uh, so that was happening for six weeks. And at the same time, I was in rehearsal with Dusseldorf um, over video. And it, I think you might have one image of that, Patrick um, Stewart. Or, um, and uh, it's, um, I think it's just an image of, us in a read through or something and they just happened to be anyways it was incredibly pixelated i'm so sorry i just realized that i should have sent um better images but um last minute this is what i have so this was a very kind moment when everyone decided to turn to the camera <laughs> and do the read through so i could see them uh but the rest of the time it was pretty awkward um i mean it was amazing the team went above and beyond to try and make it work and you know um the artist, uh, the director, you know, brought in his own intern and, you know, put him in charge of the uh, iPad to make sure that we had someone, you know, showing us things while rehearsal was going on because they were all in person and we, uh, the sound designer and I were over here. Um, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a lot, um, but it was really interesting. I just, I can't tell you how fascinating it was to try to experience all this um, co-creation, co-presence, collective practice, collective creation or devising uh, all in, um, in the virtual world. Um, it was really interesting. I'm sorry, I feel like I might have wandered a little bit from your question. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I don't see you when I'm talking, so I'm sort of, I, 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 don't, I don't know. <laughs> There's no visual feedback. Jackie, can we come back to something that you said at the beginning about um, uh, about the yeah I, I guess the barriers between art forms um, or the kind of being more open to the possibility of blending art forms together? Um, can you just talk about how things have changed on that front um, at NTS and what maybe you'll be doing in future that perhaps wouldn't have been the case if we hadn't found ourselves in this strange situation? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think what's fascinating is how 
even in the short space of time since March, how the form has evolved. So when we began doing scenes for survival, it was very much about theatre makers occupying an online or a digital space. And now in July and August, when we made the ghost light film, it was very much about hybridizing the theatre and the film art form to create something that we, as the time has gone on, we have felt more confident about letting go of some of the elements of theatre in order to embrace film and digital. And in doing so, I think that's created a different type of art form. So I think the ghost light film uses theatre talent, but it also embraces the art form of film. And it's directed by Hope Dixon Leach, who's an amazing filmmaker. So, it, so we're kind of unabashedly uh, calling it a film, whereas at the beginning of the lockdown, we were talking about we would use every kind of word to describe our five minute pieces of theatre other than film, because we wanted to kind of make sure that we were still um, mm -hmm. kind of fulfilling our national aims of being, you know, for for and off theatre, whereas now I think um, we're embracing the, the way that we might have hybridized types of art forms going forward. I'm just really struck as well by um, the conversation about co-creation. We did, we've done a, a project during lockdown called the Coming Back Out Ball, which was supposed to be a live event with um, the um, LGBT community in Scotland. And we've actually kind of merged the digital form to make those, um, to make that event go online. And that was, a, again, there's another thing that seems to be emerging from this conversation about community work and how work, working with particular communities might actually be done better using technology because we're creating safe spaces, we're interrogating power, we're interrogating um, kind of hierarchies of, of value in a way that allows us to sort of question and, and, and bring people together in a much more um, equitable way. And, and I, I feel like that's something we want to hold on to going forward. I think it's so interesting what you're saying about language and about terminology for things because we have at the Culture Summit have experienced the exact same thing like is it a film is it a broadcast is it a, what is it you know we've really struggled to articulate while not claiming more expertise in one area than we necessarily have but also not abandoning the roots of what the presentations should have been in the first place it's really it's really interesting but as you say i think there has been a growing confidence in a really short space of time and i sort of think about when um in a previous life when i worked for creative scotland and we would look at organizations digital plans and the things that people were setting out to do over like a really long period of time in lots of cases people have seemingly turbocharged that and just made so much progress in particular directions in a really in a really compressed time but i wonder what that means in the longer term for audiences because that's one of the things that feels extremely kind of um experimental about it all you know it's really difficult to track who's watching things and what a measure of success would look like you know how many can you expect jake can you help us a bit with that when you're making work in this way what are your kind of um, metrics around any of that no, I was going to say, I, I also relate so much to what Jackie was just saying about not sh not wanting to call this thing just a video. You kind of want to have this other term for it. I guess it's like I've had exactly the same, um, you know, when we had a stage show and I was working with a real life physical drag performer on a real stage, then of course, you know, it's stage. And, and that was um, a drag performer called Me, at Me the Drag Queen, and they're a really brilliant drag performer. But now we're like starting to go into this virtual space and it's like, is it a digital artwork? It's more than just film. It's like, can we maybe rethink how to create something that's maybe much closer to theatre and much more performative than just watching a static film and create something that's got more of a kind of serendipity or unexpectedness, you know, they bringing in interaction using technology that exists. So that's kind of what I'm trying to think about at the moment and, and developing that myself um, for the web browser is kind of how can I create something that gives you a real feeling of being in a space like actually affects your mood, allows you to watch these performances as they go by 
And I think, yeah, no, there's something really interesting in that. At the moment, I'm maybe calling it tentatively a virtual cabaret, but I know that kind of comes with issues as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with your points. I think it's, it's a really hard one, one that we're all kind of still thinking through. Rosera, did you have like, similar experiences when you were trying to describe for your audience what, what it was you were presenting? <laughs> Yes, uh, absolutely the same. But I think also it was it was a, uh, I mean there was there was also a kind of side question about the um, uh, like the film classification board. So there was, because we, you know we 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 worked on a very short timeline. So um, it was it was getting works uh, works up and and uh, not calling them film because they weren't really film. <laughs> but yeah, there was there was um, uh, a lot of. Uh, complications around that but also because so so much of the work was meeting of 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 of, of dis different uh, of artists from different disciplines uh, as well as as the you know the final the final um, outcome or, or or the work that that we did carry on the festival had then wandered into another space for example and and actually you know so it was very it was very complicated we came up with all kinds of of, of strange kind of <laughs> in between classifications like it's not theater it's not film it's um it's uh, stage to screen <laughs> for example it, it was a kind of complicated moment indeed jenny and how did your audiences respond to that were you able to kind of tell what and what was the level of comfort with south african audiences beforehand um with the sort of work that you ended up presenting yeah, I mean, audience is a huge, huge question uh, for us for for many reasons. Uh, like I was saying initially, we made the decision very quickly and we kind of plowed into it. And so, in the first case, I think it's probably important to note that that the the the, the digital divide or access to to internet or 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 um, devices is uh, is we have a very different picture in South Africa than I presume in 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 in, in Canada or or Scotland. Um, I think from like a 2011 consensus, we have something like 10% of our population with um, with fixed line internet access, but but uh, m most people have have mobile phones. So we found, some, I mean, this is of course retrospectively, we found, I think something like 60% of our audience were accessing um, our website and, and the works using using smartphones. Uh, so there was there was a lot of this kind of um uh looking making sense of things uh, in retrospect google analytics provides a, a kind of hor horrifying amount of data on <laughs> on users but in terms of, of 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 the idea of having work um or having the festival on online i mean there is so i had mentioned earlier the fakugesi festival which is kind of the main it's 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 i suppose the most well-known digital possibly the only digital arts festival in in south africa that has has happened on an ongoing basis and it's i mean it's it's you know the the whole scene is quite small so so in terms of audience it's not um it is it was something very new um and the idea of 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 of, uh, of say visiting or experiencing the work of the festival online or on a website uh was was also very new um and i I mean, we got we got a lot of feedback. We also we also had um, uh, you know, let me say rather, we made a decision to do a lot of to have a lot of the work uh, available video on demand, um, and just kind of to give ourselves the space um, to to be able to 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 carry the different kinds kinds of works, and 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 so I think there was um, a very interesting. Uh, reflection post the festival, which was that, uh, in terms of, of ticket sales and access, we we did sell individual tickets to shows, but we also sold a kind of festival pass, and that was where most of our audience. That is, that's that's the majority of ticket sales. So there was something of of, of something in 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 the idea of the, of the audience kind of buying into the overall festival or kind of taking you know cu coming into the, into this experience. As opposed to 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 um, entering in through through one work at a time, I'm not sure if that if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I think I think for me post festival, there's really a lot of thinking that 
um, that has to go into now how we can, you know, continue because because of course working online we, we it's it's been it's been amazing in terms of, of facilitating international collaboration like what we're doing right now. That very first video that that I that I shared with you of the the lonely sailor that you know that was made by about seven people all in their homes in different parts of, of of Johannesburg. So 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 as a tool, as a collaborative tool, it's really it's really um uh, it's phenomenal what can be can be done. But as a platform for presenting for presenting work, so 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 the screen or making use of of uh, of um, of the internet to share work, it's not it, you know there's a, there's a huge um, majority of our population who aren't going to be able to access that. So there's for me the kind of next question, particularly around audience, and because we have such a such a, a a mix of of audience in South Africa is. Is how to kind of find space for to, to, for for live uh, for public space um, again coming off the back of what we've done. It's the million dollar question in a way, isn't it? Would anybody else like to respond to that? But what they see is the future for how we begin to reconvene live audiences. Um, Helen, you want to come? I think yeah. Um... At the, well, I mean, it's from a very different perspective, not as a presenter, uh, but, um, and I, I mean, I totally understand, like, I, it's fascinating, these presenterly questions um, and concerns, and I, uh, I guess, from my perspective, going back to your original question for me about communities, um, my work has always been inventive and um it, from the margins or having to fit in or be slender or flexible. And um, so pivoting to the pandemic was in many ways, like just another thing I have to invent around. Um, and what was really profound, what's really allowed um, us as a team to, and the ideas around the laboratory for artistic intelligence, what it, it's allowed us to do is ma to mature rapidly because um, uh, the crisis created, um, well, it, it, everyone's been talking about this heightened need, right? Like it's really clear um, where people are at and um, because our work is very much about meeting people where they are, um, it, um, it's actually really clarified and made it easier to create work in, in some ways or to create, uh, and when I say work, I mean create initiatives. Um, and so like this creative practice we would do in the mornings for just one hour, uh, it's the simplest, most basic thing of holding space for um, creative practice. So for any number of, you know, improv, um, uh, creativity exercises, it could be writing, drawing, uh, any number of things, um, exploring your bodies, meditation, singing, um, and uh, and I think it's been so rewarding to see um, how much value that truly has. Going back to that other thing you were asking, um, what is the value of the arts? Um, so with the Laboratory for Artistic Intelligence, because we're about in a sense, we're deconstructing what is artistic intelligence, what does art know, what do artists know, um, and um, trying to find ways to take these components and um, re, I don't want to say reinsert, that sounds a little bit awkward, <laughs> not quite the right visual metaphor, but reintroduce them, um, return them into parts of society where it's lacking where it's not as present, where um, where there really is appetite and need for more imagination and more uh, connection with one's um, creative self. And, you know, not in even in a strictly artistic sense, but awakening um, the ability to uh, to um, create meaning, to shape one's narrative, um, all these things that relate to self-actualization and um, I actually think, yeah, it's been really um, profound to be able to serve people that way. And um, I, I don't know, I, it's going to have like uh, the, the amount of um, appetite 
is really going to be something that I, th I hope <laughs> continues to feed us through all the ups and downs of like arts funding and all those other uh, challenges. What you're saying, I was watching today a, a clip of um, and Andy Haldane, who um, at the Bank of England, who is going to be part of the Culture Summit programmes that we're releasing next week. So I hope I've not just <laughs> given anything away. <laughs> um, but he was talking about a creative education and the importance and the value of that and the ability to take learning from one bit of or from one discipline and apply it to another and that kind of plastic way of thinking about things and um, i'm just thinking helen about some of the work that you've been doing at the laboratory for um, artistic intelligence which is really fascinating but all the words that like all of our panelists today are using around collaboration and co-creation and generosity and experimentation and how do we embed that as a way of working that doesn't disappear after this current moment because it does seem that this has been characterized by a kind of generosity that people can try out things and we say all the time that we're doing that in the arts but we don't always do, we don't always do it um so can you just talk about that you know because i know that you do work with organizations already on how to kind of promote those values what do you see as being the things that will stick from this and how do we um, keep hold of some of those values Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> first of all, I'm sorry, uh, Stuart, I don't know if you're in charge of the video mixing, but could I ask you for me to just, like stay in the plenary uh, mode? Because I, I feel like I, it's really helpful for me to be able to see my fellow panelists if uh, that's okay with you all. Um, I think that's an enormous question in terms of um, it, the way it's framed as like, what should we do? What, what must we do? And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm like, I do not enjoy being prescriptive whatsoever. Um, I will say that, um, yeah, uh, it, it, for, with Canadian government over here, it's been fascinating because, look, they pulled together this incredible um, version of temporary universal basic income, not quite universal, but still some form of basic income for millions of people. Uh, within, I believe it was four or six weeks, and that's incredible. Um, public service can move quickly, um, and uh, you know the kind of massive reorganization that people were talking about for the climate crisis, and like people were saying, no, you can't do that, and here we are, <laughs> massively reorganizing. Unfortunately, and, and this is a side note, but like no one's talking about the environmental impacts of PPE. Like so, here we are manufacturing millions upon billions of like masks, which thank God we have masks, but also like, oh no, we have all these masks now um, and they're like single use. Um, so it, it's a powerful, it's wonderful to have in living memory an example of, hey, you can pivot quickly. Um, I will say that in, for me, what's always been hard is, um, is that as uh, an artist, I feel like, so I'm really going to speak to my experience. This is not going to be the truth for everybody, but um, I can have really great conversations in a small group or one-to-one -one with um, a policymaker or someone, you know, a bureaucrat, um, and we can connect and they see it, they get it. But for them to then go turn around and translate that upwards or sideways to their peers, um, I've actually realized for all that I don't identify as a performer, it is a performance. Every single time I have these meetings, it's a performance and I'm um, carrying some of that um, affect in and infecting people with it, right? And But they themselves are not performers. So, so for them to turn around, I've, I've actually seen like colleagues, um, you know, stand up in a conference and then try and like um, sell an idea and they're looking at me like trying to like channel some kind of energy uh and it doesn't like and there's so much yeah it's it's incredibly difficult and so for me what i i keep advocating for is to have artists in residence inside of um all kinds of organizations places spaces in society where you don't normally find artists so be that in government be that in social service organizations you know wherever because um the moment it's not even what the artist creates uh is what i've said um it's not the artist coming up with all the solutions because we are not the subject matter experts. Um, but uh, 
apart from all the different ways in which we can uh, name things, give things a metaphor, um, a shape, uh, draw out what's been uh, not like less noticed, overlooked, etc. Um, apart from those types of abilities and sensitivities that we have as an artist to reframe and re rethink, um, by simply being who we are, and I, and I was saying to you, Jenny, um, in our other call, um, being willing to play the fool and to not need to be the smartest person in the room and not need to like win whatever it is that people are trying to win, <laughs> um, but to just be human, to be intensely subjectively human in these spaces is so powerful. I've seen it happen over and over again. Um, and and it, what it enables is for everybody else in that room to uh, bring more of themselves to the table. Uh, the moment I start identifying as an artist and I just be who I am, it meant that so many people in these really strange and square spaces um, start coming out of the closet and, you know, they reveal themselves like, oh, I, I danced for, you know, 20 years or, oh, I'm working on a book or what have you. And, um, and they, uh, yeah, like there's just so much more um, capacity. Uh, and I think we both need to ask for these spaces to be created for us and we need to go and just like occupy them. Would anyone else like to come comment or come in on that one, Jake? I think um, also maybe part of what you're saying is is how can we create these sort of spaces that are conducive to creativity, and how can we be I don't know encouraging and keeping the curios curiosity. And I, I guess um, maybe for some people this period of time has almost been like one long artist residency, but obviously that comes with a lot of privilege. <laughs> there are, you know, less other things that you're thinking about time to research and experiment. Um, I think, you know, as a research based artist, not a huge amount has really changed for me because I'm quite used to spending long periods of time on my own, kind of developing my concepts and, you know, experimenting and researching. Um, but yeah, no, I think I think that's something interesting in that. And, and, and maybe that this period of time will create a huge amount of of new work um, and a, a whole new generation of artists. But yeah, we'll, we'll just have to see, I guess. I think for others, you know, struggling with mental health and other such things, it's been a really difficult thing and definitely not conducive to being creative. Yes, yeah, hard relate to that. <laughs> Jackie, do you want to come in on that one in, in particular about how we hold those values um, especially when the, the National Theatre have kind of, as you mentioned before, that public service remit and that responsibility um, and a leadership role and kind of um, and offering work to other artists and to keeping keeping the wheels turning. And um, can you just reflect on that or how you'll take that forward? Yeah, I mean, I guess the other thing that what's been said before has 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 really has really made me think about is the way that the last you know five months has made institutions really question themselves so there has been during during the pandemic there's also been black lives matter there's also been this kind of peeling back of a kind of set of structural inequalities within um within culture, you know, the, the the conversations that have been bubbling under the surface for a long time and have kind of been thrown into relief around um, the freelancers. There's a whole host of intersecting conversations happening at the moment that as institutions, we have to kind of lean into our own um, vulnerabilities and need to to kind of reassess ourselves um so yeah that, that's not really answering that question but that's just a reflection on the kind of long-term impact of what has been happening um recently and and from nts's point of view we um we have you know over the period of um of the covid crisis we've employed around 300 freelancers because we felt that that's a really really important thing to do um and I think 
what I'm now getting my head into a kind of sh cognitive shift is that we aren't like, you know, for, for the first couple of months, I was really trying to plan next year as though I was kind of going back to the National Theatre of Scotland model from before. And we are desperate to assemble human beings in the same space. We're desperate to do what we do best, which is to take work around all of the communities in Scotland. We are, you know, a theatre for everyone and that, that's what we do. But we're also really going into a mental shift where the reality of um, what audiences need, what they feel like they're they're going to feel safe participating in is completely different. So there's something around living with uncertainty whilst trying to be optimistic and hopeful and ambitious at the same time. Um, yeah, it's um, from next year onwards, things aren't going to go back to the way that they were before. They're going to, this is an opportunity to rethink kind of what our national cultural values are and how we, um, how we all function together. So I've just got, I've got a baby and a five year old, which I have to acknowledge for five months. I've just, whenever I can hear my baby crying or my five year old running riot, rather than pretend it's not happening, it's best to acknowledge it. That's my one learning of the whole period. I was hoping they were going to pop in. <laughs> cool that we got this far, if I'm honest, I'm like just baby off to the side here. And yeah, that's one thing I don't think we're ever going to go back to the same um, patriarchal structures of working. It's like I have a, I have a new baby and there's, and there's no point in pretending that I don't. <laughs> there's something quite refreshing about all of those things collapsing, though, isn't there? Like I I've, I've feel in my working life, I've often have to kind of really separate family out from out from everything that you do. Um, and it's so unnatural in a lot of ways. And there's one aspect that I found a, slightly a relief to just admit that there's so much pressure with family and things and to make that literally visible. Um, it's, yeah, I, it's so interesting to think about what we will take forward from this and what bits we will be glad to leave behind <laughs> in a way. We're almost, that's the full hour up. So I knew that would happen, that we would kind of, rush through um but do, does anyone want to have any last reflections there's one question in from the audience that i would like to just put to you which is about sustainability um and how we integrate our ideas and ambitions um around a more sustainable practice in the future which it is a bit of a whole other topic but does anyone want to come in and interpret sustainability however way you like whether it's to do with environmental or individual or sectoral or we can think about that another day um i'll just say briefly that uh yeah i i think there are like tons of people who can speak to the climate crisis sustainability aspect of that um, question. Um, I, I'm just going to go back to, um, again, I'm sort of on delay, <laughs> but um, in terms of this interest, so we have a couple of uh, large festivals here and uh, this interest in um, intersecting between arts and other non-artistic sectors. Um, I think there's like the festivals are an amazing uh, resource or or sort of infrastructure for doing that, and I'm grateful that you know Luminato has uh, out for that and um, invite us uh, us into their uh, to piggyback on their infrastructure to get involved with um, the social work, um, the social sector, um, and something that we've been talking about is. Um, uh, the volunteer programs, festivals oftentimes employ uh, or engage uh, hundreds of volunteers. And that's a really profound um, shelter or a, a infrastructure that can be used um, and just like with more intention, um, it can be reimagined in a way that is able to serve multiple um, bottom lines, so to speak. Um, uh, informally like you know already people join for sometimes for the work experience etc but what i'm really hoping is to interest more for example cultural institutions here in um 
uh, turning their volunteer programs into um, really much more relevant work experience for uh, newcomers, new immigrants and refugees. That's something that Luminao was doing, but isn't like formally as um, substantive as it could be. Um, I think that people, um, so there's going green, but then there's also the intersecting consequences of the climate crisis. So the mass displacement of people um, and the fact that we, uh, so lots of people will be displaced. We will have more refugees and immigrants. Um, and then also we will be living in a world where there is less being shared um, amongst more. And so um, I, I would say that I actually am like increasingly less interested in conversations about ticket sales and like things which matter absolutely do and i mean I, i'm involved in a recommendation engine project um but uh it's really about for me the the sociological function of uh, arts and culture where we um are able to transmit and um practice values that are going to be important for human um so as much as i love deeply deeply love and crave the craft of you know fine theater making fine dance like you know um virtuosic performance um i'm currently really interested in the the toolbox that these artists have and how we take that into community to serve um like to fix things that modernity introduced by like you know isolating and siloing everybody turning everyone into a robot that works in some sort of factory um we just we have so much healing we have to do as as population <laughs> at the population level um mental health as jake said um yeah so mental health um which of course is directly linked to physical health and um immigration climate crisis like I think there's so much we can do that is beyond our existing containers beyond our existing forms so yeah it's helpful to think about art as being one of the things and the arts in general as being one of the things in the toolbox um Rosera. yeah I I suppose just to throw something out um in response to sustainability uh but particularly um I suppose I can call it economic sustainability for lack of a, of a better option at this point. I think, I mean, and of course, coming from South Africa and the particular um, context uh, of, of, of South Africa, but also uh, also on the continent, on, on Africa, how so a lot of our professional arts um, sector is, is it's, an, it's an export economy, really. And so with, um, I mean, of course, we do have we have varying uh, different types of, of, of arts of arts industry in South Africa and elsewhere on the continent. Um, uh, but I think it's just important to note, um, and I and I I mean, and, and particularly, you know, we have these opportunities now to have these kind of um, immediate um, and the possibility for ongoing dialogue uh, more internationally. And I think it's important to highlight that, uh, you know, where in this in the situation where we have um, had cancelled tours, where we have uncertainty about um, when you know what kind of programs look like uh, in the future, and and so you know we have a, a huge we have a loss of income, of course, uh, for for many artists who would have who would kind of say do one gig in Germany and and be covered to a certain extent for 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 a long period of time. But what I think um, may not be understood is that 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 income is not necessarily simply one artist's income. You, you, many times, you, uh, an artist, an international artist, would also through their individual practice would be funding uh, programs, would be in funding community programs, uh, companies that employ other people. And so with, uh, we, you know, we already had difficulty, uh, or, uh, well, let me rather say, um, mobility has, has increasingly become a problem with, 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 uh, with tight, you know, tightening um, uh, restrictions on border controls, uh, Folk, uh, nationalistic uh, mindsets uh, and of course visa issues but now it's it's of course um, uh, more more dramatic more immediate more more complete and something that I am really um, 
really sad about and and kind of very aware and and and, and desperate to just kind of pay attention to is that I think over the over the kind of in, um, um, well, I think it's already happening, uh, and and will continue to. We will lose. When I say we, I mean South Africa and also elsewhere on the continent. We will lose many independent uh, projects. Independent, uh, you know that 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 have that have been ongoing that do connect to community and and this is this is really a tragedy. And I I think so. I think and or what we have to do is begin to, and you know maybe continuing in this way of of um, experimentation of. Of being open to 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 fail, but really just try to 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 invent um, new ways for for north and south to really interface um, around work, around the development of work. A lot of you know a lot of it is around the the sense that you have a you have a work as a finished product and then you tour the product. But of course, you know um, the the uh, I think as Jake was saying is it's um, Anne Helen. You know this this new um in the new context of of, of lockdown and 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 restricted movements we have it's almost we're more open to the idea of residency the and the notion of of kind of time and duration it's it's um become something else totally so i think there's a lot of space to to and i think it's exceptionally important for especially organizations institutions festivals based in the north who are interested in continuing to have international connection points um, to actively uh, find ways to continue to to um, to work with international artists because um, the repercussions of 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 losing tours are are actually quite extensive um, and uh, and will have very long term effects in terms of of supporting the arts and next generations of, of, of artists. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. So it's so interesting to hear about the different kind of pressure points and different um, geographical regions as well. We are going to have to leave it there, though, because we've already romped through an hour and 15 minutes. We do have to go. There's an, a Zoom room, um, which if you've registered to see the event, you'll have a wee link um, to join us in Zoom if you want to just, um, as audience members, comment or um, engage in what, what you've heard, put forward your own experiences. And we'll, um, our panellists are very welcome to join us there as well. But thank you so much for bringing all of your intellect and experience to our conversation. And there's lots of wee kernels of things that you've all said that will um, remain with me. The final session of our five um, conversations is tomorrow. And it's quite appropriate for a lot of the things our guests today have said, because it's about how art sustains us above all else, particularly in turbulent times. Um, so thank you, Jake, uh, Jake Elwes, Rosetta Seathill, Helen Young and Jackie Wiley. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks too to Jill and Nicole um, on BSL signing today and Patricia on our captions. Thank you.